Take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. I don't, I don't speak from uh, Revelation a whole lot, especially in this kind of setting. I've done different series in that before. Uh, but this morning, this is what the Lord laid on my heart. Well, actually, not this passage, but I want, I want you to see why, why I'm doing this passage right here. And Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. It's a futuristic book. Well, for us, a lot of the things that we're going to get into today is present. But it's neat to know that the Lord was looking forward in time, and a lot of the Bible is written past. It's history. It's things that we've already gone through. But listen what else it says. And he said, and he signified unto his angel, the servant John, bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things he saw. Now notice verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I, I, I just think that is really cool how God puts it in there. Hey, blessed is though because I'm going to give you something that is so vital, so important, so directly addressed to us. I mean, you, you, the, the lot of the Bible, I know, we look back and we talk about the time of Abraham and Isaac, what God did and Noah and the ark. And we look at those as so disconnected. But when you tap into what God said, man, I'm going to give you something just for this generation. So let me, let me pull you up to the spot that I believe is address, addressed right to us, which is chapter 3. So just turn the page, one or, one or two pages over. And I want to speak on the subject of where is Christ in your life? Where is Christ in your life? And I know being a Christian, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to open this up because I know a lot of you are going to get toss in what I'm saying, because I, I don't want people thinking, well, you, that guy got up and I, I'm saved, and I, he's saying that Christ is not in my life. So let me clarify what I'm saying. Uh, when I'm saying, do you have God in your life, or where is Christ in your life? What does this mean, and what does this look like? Because people say that all the time, as for, oh, I, I know the Lord, or I've got God in my life. And I know the Bible says, and let me clarify, I've been bought with a price, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, I can go across this church right now, a lot of you would stand up and say the same thing. Say, Pastor Tony, I know I'm saved. I, I'm, I'm going to heaven. I know the Lord is my personal Savior. And I'm, man, thank God for that aspect of it. And say, my life belongs to Christ. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've got it nailed down. I know my assurance of salvation. So I don't want to get off track when I, with what I'm talking about. But when we ask people, where is God in your life? I, I've, I've gone up to people or young people, I, I, you know, that maybe grew up in church, or, or, or you as an adult where you grew up in church, and there was a time in your life where you just completely slipped out. And there's that period in your life, which these are the obvious example. You say, well, I didn't go to church, I didn't serve God, or whatever. And if I went up to you at that point in your life and said, where is God in your life? I'm asking you, what would you say is the evidence of God working in your life? But let me bring it home a little bit more. What about people that go to church? This is where I'm at right now. I'm talking about us. So don't sit there and go, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this. No, today I'm, I'm talking about the one sitting in the pew right now, you and me. And just so you know, I wrote this message with one person in mind today, and that's myself. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to share this with you because this is something that the Lord has convicted me about. The Lord has showed me things. The Lord has touched my heart about, and, and, I, and I'm going to be just sharing this with you today. When I, when I ask, where is God in your life? Let me, before you quickly say, yes, I, I, I've got God in my life. The cliche, everybody says it. But let me ask you, is, 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 there, is there signs of God in the way you walk your walk? Is, is there signs of God in the passion that you have for God? I'm not, I'm not saying, yeah, we go every Sunday. I'm saying, is there, is there this drive in your heart to me? Man, I want to see souls saved. And, oh, what are, what, are, what are they doing? And how is the church reaching people? Man, the pageant's this weekend. Man, I, I've got so-and-so on my mind, and I've got so-and-so on my heart. I want to see these persons. Yeah, stay in touch with what I'm saying here. What I'm saying, do you have God in your life? There's no service in your life. Well, let me ask you. Jesus, we say that we're Christ-like, and Christ was an example of sacrifice. He came and gave his life. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. We're Christ-like, right? 
Where's the sacrifice in your life? You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, I'm not going to get involved in that play. They, 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 they use Sunday afternoons, and I'm not going that. And the Christmas offering, oh, I'm not doing And all these things that we're like, and I'm saying, okay, we're Christians, right? And we're followers of Christ. We live for eternity. God is everything to us. Uh-huh. Where is Christ in your life? If, 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 if somebody, if the Holy Spirit came up to you right now and said, Father, I'm not getting a pulse. I, I know, you know, what's going on that shows the evidence of God? And I'm not just speaking of the outward things. I'm talking about the relationship that we have with God. I'm going to do something weird this morning. I'm going to preach a passage of Scripture in reverse. Normally we start with verse 1 and we go to verse 3 in in, in an instant. I'm going to start with the last verse and then work my way backwards. And then I'm going to show you why that I'm saying this is so important. In Revelation, we have a very familiar passage, and this passage is describing the church age. We, we have, and I say unto the seven churches, and it lays these seven churches out. We believe, and I could go through, and I've done this before in Revelation series, where I've walked through the church ages, and I showed the one before us, where God said, Behold, I give you an open door that no man can shut, and how the, the great revival and evangelists and preachers and tent revivals and, and the, the solid dust trail and all those things that we know about and we've read about and part of our history and we love and the crusades and all these amazing things. The, when, when colleges were started for the, the preaching of God's word and for training of preachers, and it, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, we, we look back and see that and you say, man, it's sure not that way today. I don't believe it is that way today, but I believe the Bible laid it out and told us it's not that way today. Then we, then we get into another church age, which is in Revelation chapter 3. And in that chapter, we get the church age that is the church of Laodicea. It is the apathetic church. It is the church that they're there. And the Bible says that I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. So it wasn't that they weren't doing anything. They just no, had no passion in their heart to see anything done. They were content just going to church. They were content with seeing pews full. They weren't content or to the point where they were saying, God, bring revival, break our hearts, Lord, do whatever it takes. God, that church was no longer like this. This church is just that church. Then in chapter 4, we see this description of what we believe is the rapture, the, 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 the church in heaven. It's, it's the saints falling before God. It's the casting of earth crowns before the king of kings and the lord lord it's it's our praise and worshiping god it's the the song on their heart it's those gathered around the throne it's us praising the lamb of god it's all those things but what i want to do so i'm going to pull out three verses between those two things between the church of laodicea and between chapter four when we see it i want to start at the end of chapter three and work back three points within this passage, and, study, uh, and show you what the Bible says of these three verses. Let's start Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. And this is where we find my first point, which is the plea. The plea that God had with us. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the seven churches. This is really cool wording, because I, I looked this up when I was studying. <clears throat> There's other times in Scripture that this is mentioned. And it's mentioned in the Gospels, in Matthew and Mark, where Jesus said, He that hath it here, let him hear. Or hear the, in, in different phrasings of that, but it was kind of like, you know, as us as parents, when we're trying to tell our kids something really, really important, we say, hey, you guys put your ears on, listen up, pay attention, All right, look at dad when I'm talking. You know what I'm talking about? When you kick it up a notch as parents, you want them to really, really get what you're about to say. We had Thanksgiving, and my son Jordan is in this stage of his life where he likes learning things and then experimenting with these things. And he, he said, Dad, I, I, I learned something on YouTube of how to do something. I said, what is that, son? And he said, Dad, I found this thing where if somebody straps you in using zip ties, I, I know how to break that out. I said, Jordan, let me tell you something. Zip ties are made not to break, okay? They're, especially with your, with your hands. He said, no, Dad, this guy does this. It's really cool. He puts zip ties on his hands, and then he just turns, and he does this, and he breaks them out of these handcuffs. So in case anybody ever puts you in zip ties, I know how to get on. I said, Jordan, I'm telling you, that's crazy, whatever. Five minutes later, guess what I found? Dad, watch this. And he comes, and I'm like, what are you doing? He had these zip ties on his hands. He comes in the living room. At first, I thought it was really cool because my day was going to get a lot easier. It was for way more extra food and everything. It was before we ate. 
And he turns around and says, Jordan, the, the reason why I was saying that earlier is that's, that's not a good idea. And what I left out is I was saying, Jordan, zip ties, they, get, they can keep getting tighter. They, they'll cut out the circulation. It's not a good thing. I don't want to go to the ER. I'm hungry. You know, all these things. So he turned around and, of course, Dad watched this. Boom. And it gets tighter and his hands are turning red. And finally, we're in the garage with clamps and trying to... It didn't work. <laughs> And I just remember sitting there and I thought, how many times growing up did my dad say to me, son, listen to me, seriously, listen to me. I'm telling you right now, the reason why I'm having you look at me and paying attention to what I'm saying is because what I'm about to tell you can change your life. It will affect you. It will help you. It will keep you out of trouble. It will keep you from getting hurt. I'm telling you. And right here, our God says this to us. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit of God saith to the churches. I'm thankful for the Spirit of God that speaks to us. And our world would be different and our homes would be different and our churches would be different if we listened to the plea of God as he begs us as people to listen to him. He's just asking us to listen. Now let's go to verse 21. You go from the plea to the promise. I'm going to set you up, and we're, we're going to park on point number three. The promise. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my father in his throne. Let me explain to this. This is cool. You, you, you talk about claiming a promise of God. Here he's saying this. He's telling me, and I'm, 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 I told you I'm going to start off making this personal. This is personal. He told me as Tony that I make you a promise that God, I am a child of God. And I'm just bragging on that right now, just in case you just think that I've got a big head. I am a child of God. I am a joint heir with the Father. You know what's cool? Is if, you, if you had a rich dad, which if you do, I'd like to hang out with you more. But if you had a rich dad, and we know that our Heavenly Father owns the cattle on a thousand hairs, he, hills, he, our, our God is in control, our God is the, the maker of the universe and everything. Let me tell you, I am an heir of Him. I get to be joint heirs with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And right here, this passage is almost bragging on it. He said, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. He, the, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. God gave us a promise to especially us in the last days, and this is where that passage is talking. We're in the book of Revelation, things that must come to pass. He says to us as a church, I give you the power. I give you the victory. I give you all these things. And I'm not just making this up. To him that overcome it will I grant to sit with me on my throne. It's a comparison. When he says, even as I overcame. God, God gives us this comparison to us. God has offered us this victory. And you sit back and say, wait a minute, there's no way. I, I'm telling you, in my life, as big of a mess it is, and the things that I've done and all this, and you say, there's just no way. I, I've not earned that status. I've not that... But you've got to circle a word. You've got to understand what he was saying here. Circle the word right here that says grant. The word grant means to give, to bestow, to bring forth, to deliver up, to offer. I don't have the power to overcome, but God has granted me the power to be able to overcome things in my life, which I would know not normally be able to do myself. You say, man, Pastor Tony, I'm... I almost zone out messages like this because I don't see that kind of power in most Christians' lives. I go to church and I listen and I've got my kids and my marriage and my problems and all this other stuff. I don't see what you're talking about. I don't even, for some people, when they talk about, man, you can be an overcomer, we almost tune it out and just say, you know, I'm just, I'm just so tired of hearing messages like that. Good, you're the person I want to talk to. Because the reason why we're working in reverse because I believe too many of us want to claim the promises of God, the overcoming victory, the fact that God's on the throne, that he said he's going to grant me this, and then we sit back and live defeated, and I turn around and I say, God has showed us the key to everything in the first verse of this passage that I'm talking about, which is in verse 20. And let me tell you right now, 
The reason that I worked in reverse is because a lot of us want to claim verse 21 and we skip verse 20 and we wonder what's wrong. I'm telling you right now to the church, the people that I love, the people that I serve with, the people that I attend with, the people that I worship with, you guys that are my friends this morning, I'm telling you that I believe that we all have fallen short of verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. My last point or my first point would be the proposal. Allow me to remind you what we're still talking about, which is the local church. Talking about the saved. Philone is the location of Christ. And I'm asked, where is Christ in your life? And this is where I'm going with this. In most Christians' life, especially in the last days of what Jesus was saying, is most Christians have Jesus on the outside of their life. It's not that they are not saved. It's not that we don't have the hope of heaven. It's not even that we're not going there. But as we unveil this passage, I hope you understand that I believe that through our chaoticness, the fact that we are enriched with goods and have need of nothing and we're not hiding in a basement to have church. Most people drove here in a car. We're not walking to church. Most families are not sharing a Bible. Most people are not sitting there trying to witness undercover for the sake of losing their life. And I'm talking about back in the day of when we saw revivals broke out and when they would burn people at the stake and when they would burn Bibles and when they would have underground church, all that. And, and not that I'm thankful for where we're at. I'm thankful for my freedom. I'm thankful. But at the same time, moves a mindset among churches of everything's good. There's, there, there's something is missing it's that zeal and that passion to fight and to, to do and to, to love and all that. You, know, you guys know what I'm talking about? I hope I'm... It's just that the, the life is really good for us. You know what we're going to do on this stage? We're going to fill this place up and we're going to get up and say anything we want to from God's word and nobody's going to pull a gun on us and tell us you can't legally say that anymore. And I'm thankful for that. And you say, well, the day's coming. Well, it's not right now. So give me my stage right now. And I'm not going to throw my opportunity away right now. Because this is the blessings of God that I get to say that he was born in a manger. He died on a cross and he rose again. That's my right. That's my blessing. And I'm thankful for it. But sometimes when we have it so easy. And it's, it's, there's no fight or threat to it. It almost, it almost becomes, oh, how many nights are we doing that thing? It's like, oh man, alive. Is he crazy? What are we doing that for? God said, if you were having an OSU Buckeye game five nights in a row, would you show up for that? If it was a baseball game that was a World Series and they were doing it for seven nights, would you show up for that? If it was if it was a sale at a store and you had to camp out in the cold for 20 bucks off a TV. You know why we're all laughing? Because I did that. I know I didn't do that. I just, I, my son Logan wanted something from one store and it was one of those get there in the middle of the night things and it was going to be an adventure of dad and I didn't think it was a store that would have a line, an hour and 45 minute line, line. It was a very cold black morning Friday for me. And, and I'm telling you, I did it because my son wanted this so bad. He's standing there with his money in his hand and his coupons. And he had this all worked out. And he was so pumped and excited about it. And it was a gift he's buying for his brother and sister and everything. And I was willing to do that. And I thought, you know what? We'll do that for a deal. But then we'll have a play. And they're like, oh, my goodness. How many? That guy's crazy. You've got to be there. What time do we have to be there? All this just so 1,300 people can hear the gospel and maybe not go to hell for all of eternity? Is he crazy? And I know I'm being... But I, I do believe, and I'm telling, talking to myself, that I do believe that I fall in some ways in that church that is lukewarm and rich with goods and have need of nothing. That I, I, I honestly think that in a lot of ways I've gotten so comfortable what I've gotten that I've stopped to appreciate what I have. 
And as a result, I believe in my life and our finances that God sit there going, they're having a Christmas offering at their church and every dime of it's going to go to helping people hear the gospel so they have a chance of salvation and not go to hell. And God comes up and says, hey, how's it going? And oh, wow, that is, man, they got a sweet TV in there, man. Man, smart TV, because the other TV was dumb and they had to get a smart TV. What's up with that? Man, it used to be where it's like, honey, i got to go from the 32 to the 42, and now we've got to get the 42, and it's got to have brains to it. And I mean, just the word, we will never be satisfied, I'm telling you. The next best thing, the next best phone, the next best thing that hits the market that they're telling you, the iPhone 25 ST, whatever, it's, it's coming, I promise you. And it will always be coming. But I wonder when it comes to our finances if God's on the inside or the outside. Because we're enriched with goods and have need of nothing and it's just like, honey, I'd, if we get $50 in the offering, it's going to cut back on the size of my TV. That I, you know, I, I guess it's really bothered me. Not looking at you, know, you bother me. No, I'm saying I bother me. I really bother myself. Because I'm thinking, why... Am I missing out on, boy, to have God on the throne and him to say, I, I grant unto you the power of the throne and to be an overcomer and all these things that he said? Because I think that we dwell too much in verse 21 and we're not willing to do verse 20. We're not even willing to examine ourselves to know why verse 20 is not working. Let me, let me, let's, read, let's get into this. This is what he says. I love the fact that he says that he's knocking. Because even after he explains the church of Laodicea in verse 16 and 17 of how he describes that, even in the fact that there is Christian after Christian that is sitting there, that we've kind of pushed God out of our time and our schedules, and we're so busy, and we've got this and we've got that and all this, in light of all that, in light of, uh, of how I, I don't have time for God in my devotions because I, I spend too much time, in, in, in fun things on our phone or fun things on TV or fun things on our iPad or whatever. And, and God's saying, boy, what, where, where, where's that time with me? And God's doing this. And to me, that's just amazing. Because I don't deserve this. You say, what is that? That's God saying, I know what you've done. But I still want in. I, 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 know, I know that TV is really nice. And I know that high speed. And, and I, I know your phone. And man, you guys have been waiting for that new to game to come out. And all these other things. And you're so busy. And I know you're working. God says, but I still want in. You say, why is that? Because I'm telling you, he loves me. In spite of my failures, in spite of all those things, and in spite of us living in the last days, and let's turn around, we, we can get mad and you say, man, we are living in the last days, and it's so evident in all this. And God's saying, if you would stop being so consumed with what this mayor is doing, what this president is doing, what all the other stuff, and get back to just, just answer the door. You're so consumed with what everybody else is doing, and God's saying, I just want in. I just... Here, here, here's what he's saying right here. This passage, you break it down. This proposal right here. He says, if any church will hear my voice and open the door. What's it say? If any, what's the word? Man. You know it's personal? Do you know revival comes to the church when it's personal? We're looking and saying, man, if that church would get on fire for God, and God's saying, man, if you'd let me in. It, it's, it's not some sort of great movement that God's waiting to sweep across Fellowship Baptist Church. God's looking for that individual that would be heartbroken that's do that. Here's, let me explain this. Here, here's what I've learned from this. When, when God is yelling out to hear, it doesn't just say, if any man hear my voice. And it does, just say, it does say that, but that's not the only thing. It says, if any man will hear my voice and will open the door. Let me tell you, that's, that's where we stop right there. Because in church, we hear the voice of God a lot. 
When we're here listening to the radio and God's singing the, the praises of God, or we're, we're reading a book, or we're reading our Bible, we hear the voice of God a lot. But I think where we stop it is when God says, let me open the door. Because when we open the door, it's a fact of surrender. Of God, you come in. God, I, I, give, you, I give you this. Here's my life, and that's what we're talking about. It's, it's the physical, emotional, the heart, the seat of emotions of man. Because, you know, the thing is, that that's where we find conviction, where God comes in and says, you know what? The reason why I'm not in here is because all these other things have pushed me out. And sometimes I'd rather not open the door and let God in because he's going to unveil to me what pushed him out in the first place. Of my selfishness or my pride or my schedule or my things, the way I spend my money or whatever it is, we get consumed with these things, but God still cries out to us. He says, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, this is a place of surrender. Let me tell you, I don't believe that we'll ever experience the overcoming without experiencing verse 20 of first hearing the voice of God, opening it and surrendering and saying, God, I can't do this life without you. God, I need you more than I need anything. But look at, and not only says this, but, but read. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will Come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I know we read this verse a lot. I've seen it on gospel tracts. I've seen it in people's homes. I, 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 I've heard this quoted so many times. But let me tell you something that I find is so neat about this, of the personal relationship with God. You guys realize how much that we talk about the personal relationship with God, but we don't experience the personal relationship with God. Here's what God says in this passage. God says, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Just stop and think about that for a minute. As much as I want God's fellowship, he wants mine. The, I, I, that, hit, that thought hit me and broke my heart. He's knocking because as much as I need God, God wants me. And we try to make this world and this, this thing we do of church so mechanical of my kids are, are in class and honey did you get the check and honey did we uh, where are we eating today and all these other things and I believe with our Christian life that God's on the outside looking through the window going hey wait a minute that's not all that I wanted it to be those are just outlets to get to me but you realize that what, what he throws in there nothing's by accident and he, he throws in there and he throws in and I will sup with him. I will have supper. It's, it's, this is a, a personal thing. You, you know what bothers me in, in t today's society is how families don't talk. And I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. And me and Jenny have talked about this. Of how we're so preoccupied. But you know what you have to do in order to sit down and have a meal. Is you've got to stop what you're doing to engage in what he is saying. You know what I mean? He said, I will sit down. And he didn't just say, we'll spend time together. He goes, no, we're going to engage in a meal together. And especially when you look in light of the customs of the Old Testament, what, what this was referencing of that intimate sit down, wipe everything away. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to sit here. You're going to sit there. And we're going to sit there. And we're going to commune. And we're going to talk. And we're going to engage. And I'm going to be with you. And you're going to be with me. I'm telling you, church, right now, that's what God wants more than anything. So, man, I thought more than what God wanted more than anything is for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and all this. Yeah, when you get to verse 21, that's what it's talking about. But don't skip open over the personal relationship with God. Don't skip over the fact that we've got to stop in our busyness, stop in our selfishness, stop in everything that we're consumed with, and put God first in our lives where he belongs. Can I tell you, let me, let me show you how this works. Verse 21 shows his power. Verse 20 shows his presence. Just for the record, we will never experience his presence without his, or we'll never experience his power without his presence. If we want to know why or what we have to do to say that I want to see God break out, I want to see souls saved, or I want to see God bring revival to my family, I've got so and so coming to play or to church or to 
family gathering, whatever, and I'm asking for God's power to be there, then God says, man, why don't you get with the one that's got the power to do it and give him what he wants, which is your heart, your relationship, and your love, and not just the going through the motions of showing up to a building. And I'm not saying this. to say, man, all you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You're just sitting out there not caring. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if we were to examine our life and go through it and say, God, have I pushed you out in my finances? Have I pushed you out in my schedule? Have I, have I pushed you out in my personal time? Lord, have I pushed you out? Are you, are you on the outside looking in? Or Lord, have I invited you in to say, God, my life belongs to you. I can do nothing without you. Lord, I don't want to face one thing without your power and presence in my life. God, I will stop, I will sit, I will engage, and I will love you because you love me and I can't live a day without you. I say all this because I love us, of what God's doing in our church and what God wants to do, but let me tell you, this passage was written to the ones living in the last days. This passage was written directly to us. This passage was written with chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3 as a promise and says, Blessed is the man that listens. And now let me show you this in order. When we read in verse 1, or chapter uh, 3, verse 20, when God says, I I desire fellowship, I want in. God says, and I'll give you the power, and I'll sit you on the throne, and we will be as one, and I, I, I I will grant unto you the Spirit of God. And then he says in verse 22, he that hath an ear, let him hear, because I promise you what you need more than anything. When you, the, the next thing, you turn the page, chapter 4, right there, boom, we go into the last days, tribulation and all those. What the church needs in the last days is a relationship with God. And he laid it out. Let me ask this. Where is Christ in your life? Where is he in your personal walk, in your personal day, in your personal prayer life, and everything else that we're talking about? Where is God in those things?